Okay, go, go, go. Welcome everyone. We're back again. We're here because we're committed to um, really thinking about how we can renew Bradfield with renewable energy. So thanks for coming and it's great to see everyone here. Welcome Elizabeth. She, Elizabeth has just uh, broken her knee, so it's great to see her here and as everyone else is here. Okay, let's go to the first slide, which is what we want to do, which is... Okay, sorry. I'm going to take that. That's all right. Yeah, so that's our uh, slide, but we would like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the land of the Dara Marigold and direct people pay our respects to their elders past, present and future. So we're in a really good time with good um, things that are happening on the renewable energy space. Chris Bowen has recently announced the National Electric Vehicle Summit Forum, which is really the direction that we really want to go if we want to electrify Bradfield. So there's lots of really positive things happening as well as some maybe not so positive things. But we have to keep going because Oh, mm -hmm. you're waiting for me, sorry. <laughs> we know around the world, the climate emergency is incredibly dangerous and impacting on millions of people. And to think that, for example, Pakistan, a third, a one third of the country is now underwater. It's just a humanitarian crisis. And these are what have the scientists predicted, just like, and in China, there's massive drought. Look, it, we are all impacted by climate and we have to decarbonize, and that's really the message. So tonight, uh, David, who spoke briefly, um, there was a picture of him there. Um, I'm going to introduce him today. David has uh, a very esteemed career in education as a professor of um, education, both at, and worked at Macquarie University in. Sydney University, he's been a writer, he's an education consultant, but he's been also passionate about implementing um, environmental solutions to the problem with solar and electric vehicles. And he's just standing behind his electrical vehicle in that photo. So David is really committed, not just talking about climate, but climate action, as well being, as well as being a musician and a songwriter. So I'm handing it over to David tonight, and David's going to take us through and talk about, you know, wh what we can achieve by electrifying Bradfield. Okay. <clears throat> thanks, Janine, and thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, I want to pay my respects, too, to the First Nations people of Daramaragal and the Darug people. Um, and they, they've known a lot about climate for a long, long time. Um, We've got a lot to move, a lot to get through, so I'm going to move fairly quickly, um, but there'll be opportunity for people to be able... No, not yet, Wayne. Mm, all right. <laughs> there'll be opportunity for people to maybe have ask some questions and have some discussion as we go through. But <clears throat> thank you, Janine, for those slides, because that certainly reminds us about the sort of issues that we're trying to deal with. And I don't want to spend um, a lot of time on that, but I do want to say a little bit about what people have called your passionate creed, which is the things that basically drive you in life. And my passionate creed about the environment uh, has been there for a long, long time. I believe really strongly, along with the First Nations people and along with Saul Griffiths from the book that he's recently written called The Big Switch, that the world, Mother Gaia, as the Greeks would call it, is a living, breathing organism that's quite capable of us, like us, in healing and rejuvenation. And it's done that a number of times, as people have reminded us, that in fact, there have been crises in the past with climate, but Mother Gaia has been able to heal and regenerate. However, that was before she had to deal with the impacts of billions of people in the world and the impacts that they've created. 
and one of the environmental writers has sort of described the human species as being um, like irritating insects on the mother on, on the back of Mother Earth that Mother Earth would really like to get rid of. Um, and in a funny sort of way, that probably describes us in lots of ways. But what I would also agree with, along with Saul Griffiths and all of the scientists out of the IPCC recent report, is that whereas in the past, Gaia has been able to regenerate itself, what we're now at is a tipping point. And that tipping point is where the ecosystems of the earth are starting to get to a point where they can't regenerate anymore. And I think that's the sort of evidence that we're starting to see uh, right now. And for example, as Janine's slides have shown, and of course the situation in Pakistan today is much worse than what we saw just then. There are now millions and millions of people in Pakistan who are not only without homes, but without food. And the problems of trying to get that to them uh, is absolutely enormous. But also in a recent article that I've just finished in the latest monthly magazine, the Australian Institute of Marine Science, who are really the caretakers of the Barrier Reef, um, not, not the ones who Turnbull gave $144 million to, who we'd never heard of before, but this is the official agency for maritime research on the Barrier Reef. And they've basically just done a research study over a long period of time. And what they're saying is that even if we don't act, then in fact, the Barrier Reef will be gone by 2050. It will be one of the last reefs to go because it has such a huge variety of species as compared to the Caribbean and other places, but it will still be gone. And maybe sort of the way I think is that maybe as a species, we are one of the worst species to actually react to the physical changes that are going around us. And that maybe up until now, we needed to have some really concrete evidence that impacted us to be able to believe what the scientists were saying. So in the past, for example, we've talked about the melting of the glaciers at the poles, we've talked about rising sea levels and so on. And that's all very well. But if in fact we haven't stood, as I have, in both the Antarctic and the Arctic, and had someone say to us, well, you know, three years ago, five years ago, we wouldn't have been able to stand here. We wouldn't have been able to have the, the machine that we've just driven up in drive up here because that's where the glacier was. And then to walk another 10 minutes to find the glacier, you start to realise just what sort of evidence there is. But until we have it at our own back door, then we don't seem to be likely to take very much notice, but we sure have it now. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about my background and why I'm so passionate about what I'm talking about tonight. That I, I had my early life in the bush and on the beach in the southern suburbs at Cronulla. So I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time in the scouts. In fact, I spent probably more time under canvas during school holidays than I did actually sleeping in my own bed. Um, I was a canoeist. I've canoed a whole lot of different rivers in New South Wales and all around the various parts of Sydney. Um, and I've also done a lots of bushwalking and so on. My professional life began as a teacher um, in rural and remote areas of New South Wales. And um, I was a geography teacher. And in the school that I was teaching at, uh, where I spent the first seven years down in Tumbarumba on the snowy mountains, all of my geography was taught outside the room because I was lucky enough to have wonderful environment in which to do that. 
and a principal who also allowed me to be able to do it. And then I spent uh, another 12 months up into the Hunter Valley before I went to Macquarie University and worked in the School of Earth Sciences there teaching geology and soil science, um, plate tectonics and paleontology. And that was when I really started to become very passionate about what was happening in the world. And my first book that I published in 1973 was called Decline of the Environment. And it was a book I'd given up talking to adults. It was a book for kids so they could go out and actively engage in investigating what was happening to the world and to the environment. It's out of print now, but all I'd say is that every word I wrote in that book in 1973 um, was just as relevant today as what it was then. And then I went to University of Sydney in teacher education, in geography, and I spent the next 32 years uh, working both there and also as an environmental educator doing lots of professional learning in environmental education all over New South Wales. So I've spent a lot of time in different sorts of environments. I've traveled throughout Europe to the Antarctic, to the Arctic. And one of the other things that really impressed me was going to countries that have nothing like the sun or the wind or the water that we've got in Australia. And there were masses of wind farms. There were masses of solar panels, even in places like the Czech Republic, for example. There were wind turbines along the North Sea, wind turbines along the Rhine River. And I kept wondering, why on earth aren't we doing this in Australia? And as Saul Griffith says, and other scientists have commented, Australia is the best place in the world to begin to think about renewable green energy. And then living at Bayview, I had solar panels, as I've already discussed. I had a solar hot water system. I was generating half the energy that we were using in the house. And I was driving a hybrid uh, petrol um, electric car for 13 years. And all I can say is that uh, it was wonderful and I never thought I'd say this again, but I now drive an MG fully electric car, um, which is even better than the hybrid. And I'll have a bit more to say about that a little bit later. And finally, I've got 13 grandchildren. And what I'm absolutely dedicated to is making sure that the world that we leave behind is a much better place than what it looked like we were going to leave behind. So that's my passionate creed. And maybe we should look at why have we identified Bradfield as being a really important place to maybe try and begin this whole green energy process. So thank you, Wayne, for that slide. So, okay, there's a lot of reasons that we can identify. I mean, first of all, it's named after John Bradfield who was an absolute electric energy visionary and uh, who saw the whole business of electrifying Sydney trains. Um, it's a bounded electoral location, so there are some boundaries to it, even though those boundaries might change. And also, um, it's very much a marginal electorate now. And so therefore, what we're able to do is have some sort of influence on all of the future candidates who might stand um, for parliament, both state and federal, um, about the need to be able to develop renewable energy in Bradfield. And that's, I think, already happening. Uh, so we've already seen Nicolette, who says that she's going to stand against Paul um, Fletcher again at the next election. Um, and we can put more pressure on in terms of the fact that it's now marginal electric. Of course, Bradfield has got a really strong history of local interest in protecting the environment, the heritage. And uh, it's interesting to note that 22% of Bradfield residents take public transport. That's why you can never get a parking place in Gordon and places like that, because 
that 22% is three times the number in New South Wales residents, and it's five times the number in Australia that actually use public transport. It's also a wealthy and a highly educated uh, electorate. 40% of the population bring in over $3,000 a week before tax. That's twice as many as in New South Wales. And 48% of people in Bradfield have got a bachelor's degree or higher. And that's twice as many as both the state and also nationally. We've now got three local councils who have all got net zero plans. And in fact, Hornsby has moved much further than the plan. Um, can we go back, please, Wayne? <laughs> and we've got lots and lots um, of other groups that are working in reducing emissions, such as reducing Bradfield's emissions, um, the Citizens Climate Lobby, the North Sydney Zero Emissions Group, Bradfield College, St Ives School, for example. We've got the influence of Matt Keane, and also we've got a connection with Saul Griffiths. And if you're interested, you can go on not only his rewiring Australia, but you can also um, rewiring Bradfield. And he has already calculated what we might be able to do in Bradfield um, with our particular project. So maybe we might just pause there for a minute and see if anybody wants to ask any questions about that rationale for why we're looking at Bradfield. So anybody who wants to ask any questions about that? No? Okay, well, let's push on. So let's push on to the big vision, if we can, Wayne, please. So this is the big vision that rewiring Bradfield is all about. It's over a 10 year, 10 year program from 2023 to 33, and it includes households and communities um, in the Bradfield electorate. So if we look at households first, what the idea is, is to, for every participating um, family who would like to do this, every household, is to um, put solar pa roof panels on their roof, to then have a storage battery in their house, to have um, uh, an electric vehicle uh, with uh, a charger for the electric vehicle, and um, also a pledge that they will replace all non-electric appliances with electric over the next 10 years. So it's not trying to make it happen immediately, but it's saying over the next 10 years, I will replace all of my gas appliances or my non-renewable electric appliances with those that are based on renewable energy over that 10 years. And then, of course, if you want any more, there's the website for the project uh, there for people to be able to go on. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. But it's not only about households, it's about the communities themselves. And what we're talking about really is a whole process of economic renewal and also income generating within communities. And this is exactly what Saul Griffiths is trying to do with the number of um, communities on the South Coast and uh, setting up a sort of model that other people can follow. And if you go on um, Rewiring Australia uh, website, you'll be able to see reports from all over New South Wales and from other states about what's happening across the whole of Australia in relation to the same sort of things that we're trying to do. And so what it means is putting solar panels on every public building, on schools. And of course, there's already a whole project about putting solar panels on schools. And St Ives is one of the schools that's involved in that particular project. On every one of the public and commercial buildings, on every parking station, on, on, on every um, parking area, on every um, shop and so on, on every shopping centre. 
Um, and then there'd be community storage batteries that that power being generated would feed into with electric vehicle community charging stations. And when we're talking about elect electric vehicles, we're not just talking about motor cars. We're talking about things like electric scooters and electric buggies. Because for example, those of us who live within a reasonable distance of our shopping that we do and, and the shops that we go to, we shouldn't be thinking about electric cars and taking out a two ton car to drive a couple of kilometers up the road to be able to do our shopping. What we should be thinking about is an electric scooter or an electric buggy um, that in fact can do exactly the same job um, with a lot less damage to our roads, a lot less damage to our air in terms of pollution because um, transport emissions are one of the worst emissions in the whole of Sydney. And we really need to do something about addressing that. And Australian emission standards lag behind the whole world in terms of what we allow diesel and petrol cars to be able to emit into the atmosphere. And it also means community owned and managed renewable energy infrastructure. So the idea is going back to the days when communities owned their energy, not when big international companies with their shareholders overseas, like AGL, like Energy Australia, like the other companies that in fact were able to squeeze out the first community owned um, electric company a couple of weeks ago because they gouged the prices on electricity. But in fact, communities that own their own power generation. And Saul Griffiths has again written a lot about that sort of idea. And what that generates is it generates training and jobs for possibly 1,600 people. Again, from statistics that have been calculated by Saul Griffiths in relation to Bradfield. What it means is people within the community who basically invest and help finance the, the solar infrastructure that we're talking about, maybe through green bonds, maybe through community banks, which are not new. They've been in various places in the UK and Europe for a long, long time. So that's the sort of big vision that we've got. Initially, um, we can't retrofit the transmission lines that we've already got. It would only happen if we were able to, in fact, electrify every single household in Bradfield. And then what would happen would be the substations that we have in Bradfield already, there are five of those, would in, in effect become storage areas for generated electricity rather than the places that now drive electricity into our homes. So in other words, the idea of retrofitting our existing transmission system um, would be something that would be possible if we were able to electrify every household and community in Bradfield. And so the idea of what we're proposing is that it would be staged over 10 years. So I'll pause there again and see if anybody's got any questions that they want to ask about that. Um, yes, David. Um, yes, Catherine. Um, what sort of um, luck have you had in actually um, convincing our local MPs about this? Have you had a chance to speak with them at the state and federal level? Well, what we know, for example, is that the Labor and Green candidates in the, in the last federal election are absolutely committed to what we're talking about. Both Janine and I had conversations with the Greens candidate. Janine has had conversations with a Labor candidate. Uh, Nicolette Bowili, of course, comes out of a, a, a career in the renewable energy industry. Matt Keane, who's the member for Hornsby, has driven the whole um, program towards electric cars. I wouldn't have my electric car if it wasn't for Matt Keane. 
-hmm. So yes, there, there certainly is that. And the, the other thing is that I think Paul Bradfield, even though he, he, he took the government subsidy to put solar panels on his roof, we can certainly put pressure on him because of the way the last election was very much about climate change. We've got an Albanese government who is committed to, you know, action on climate change and is already doing it. And we've certainly got Adam Bant and the Greens who are driving that even more than what the Labor government is. So, yes, I and I mean, the other thing, Catherine, I think is that there, there are an enormous number of agencies in Bradfield and organisations that are actually trying to do the same things. One of my concern is how do we in fact work together in some sort of coalition to make sure that, that we're not sort of competing with one another. Yes. And, and so we're going to be talking about that at our meeting, um, in fact, next Monday, um, about how that is. I'm not sure whether Sarah uh, Wynn is here tonight, but she's one of the people who we've made contact with. They're the people from um, Reducing Bradfield Emissions, RBE, um, which is a community group. There's another group at Kalara. So th there's an enormous amount of energy that's being generated towards doing this. Yes, and, and also perhaps um, discussions with the council, because if they're uh, adopting a net zero policy, then they may be prepared to, um, in a sense, help promote this, um, this rewire and renew Bradfield. Well, that's absolutely and of course, right. they've got a very wide, um, uh, uh, you know, distribution of emails. And uh, because we really need, like, thousands and thousands of people to come on board, don't we? Yeah, we do. We need, we need the whole population to come on yes, board. Yes, yes, yes. That's a very good point. But already, for example, you can go on to the Hornsby Council site and you can see what they have been doing. And they've actually been doing an enormous amount in terms mm -hmm. of renewable energy. Right. Um, but it's mainly in terms of what they as a council control. In other words, it's, it's like the energy that they're using as part of the council. But they've also put up an experimental uh, wind uh, generating um, plant exactly where I don't know, but it's up on their website. Um, and you can go on Karingai Council that of course has just finished its electric vehicle consultation, which we've actually had um, an input into. Um, mm. And also uh, you can go on to Willoughby and you can see what they're proposing as well. So we're well, well and truly connected to the councils, Janine particularly, has got a lot of connections with the councils. Um, and I, for example, am a member of a consult, well, a consultative group that is working with Karingai Council. In fact, we've got a meeting on next Thursday um, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. we're actually talking about how to implement the plan that Karingai Council um, is trying to put into place. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. And yes, we're very much aware of that. Uh, can I just say something? Stuart here. Yes, Stuart. Uh, look, uh, I try, as a journalist, I try not to play party politics. And so I have been involved with Paul Fletcher over many years. Mm -hmm. He's a very bright man and he's very well meaning and he's very technically conscious. Now, we had a group for many years called the Plateau Group which has been proposing small electric cars. And the, Paul Fletcher has been very happy to send that proposal on with recommendations to the present Labor person involved. So, you know, all, I, all I'm trying to say really is we mustn't attack someone like Paul Fletcher, who is one of the better of the Liberals, just because he's a Liberal. I, think. No, I, I agree with that entirely. 
and there's been there's no suggestion that we would do that. In fact, the whole of the project has deliberately tried to be nonpartisan. We've, we've tried to be able to talk with everybody and we'll certainly be talking with him as well. Um, and, and I mean, he, I think he, he can read, he can read the, the sort of the atmosphere and the zeitgeist of what's happening um, in Bradenfield without, you know, too much trouble either. And yeah, um, yeah. no, I agree with you. I'm, I'm sure he um, failed singularly yeah. to do that very recently. Um, and lost I, a lot of Roberta's got her hand up, so we might take Roberta and then go to Bill afterwards. Yes, look, um, there should be, um, with this new parliament, there should be a new friends of various things that they set up across the aisles. So what we really need to do, and I've been meaning to find out, we should have a, a friends of, of, you know, sort of, uh, well, whatever, climate change, electric vehicles or whatever, so that you can work across the aisle so that all uh, different flavours of, of um, parliamentarians can be involved. I think that's very important. Look, mine, you don't have to convince me of this. I mean, uh, my science teacher told me about this in uh, um, 19, what was it, 63. So, I mean, I've been very aware of it for years. I actually, while I spend most of my week in Bradfield, and I've spent a lot of my life in Bradfield, um, this, after, this evening I'm actually um, in um, where sort of Griffiths lives in, in Austin Mere. Um, there's, he's got a thing going already, 2515, um, mm -hmm. which is to rule Austin Mere and a few suburbs um, sort of north of that. And I, I think this has been going for about six weeks, might be two, two months. And he has one in five people that I have supported his initiative. Um, mm. This area is not exactly ideal in that most of us um, are below the um, Illawarra escarpment. So we do lose the sun uh, fairly early um, you know, during the winter. Uh, mm. But there is a lot going on down here. And I mean, I'd love to be doing the same thing in Bradfield wherever we can, because I do believe we've got to be engaged in all three levels of government to see where we can best fit and where action can be best taken. Yeah. Um, my, my, I, I also worked as a teacher um, in the Hornsby Council, and they were always very progressive in terms of environmental issues um, in the school that I worked. So, I mean, that was always really good with Hornsby, but we need to do what we can with, with Bradfield as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'm just anxious to do something again. My grandchildren, I have six of them. Um, I'd like to do something sooner rather than later. But there's mm -hmm. a lot of issues. Um, I, I'm aware of most of those issues. Certainly one of them is the availability of electric cars and the price of them. Okay. So whatever I'll you guys can do. Directly in a minute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So whatever you guys can do. Yeah. It really I, is so I, important. I agree, with, I agree with you totally. And we are very familiar with what's going on um, down the south coast with Saul. And I'll also address the whole issue of shade and lack of sun in a minute. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Roberta. Roberta. Um, and Bill, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, the, um, I'm just, uh, of your uh, several yeah. points there, quite happy we're, we're already an electric household, so we don't have any fuel components at all. Um, but uh, I'm a bit concerned about the electric vehicle side of things. It's always two or three years away before it's going to actually be um, pervasive enough and cheap enough and actually purchasable enough to do something about it. So I've been through this and last time I had a close look at it, we end up buying hybrids because the electric vehicle um, infrastructure and particularly the pricing is just not there um, and I've been monitoring it quite closely and while there's a lot of uh, promotion going on the actual delivery is turning out to be somewhat more problematic. Um, the other thing um, is also I'm quite open to the idea that we would uh, fit solar panels but uh, I need the thing that's always stopped us is trying to actually find people who are reliable and would do the work that we expected to, to do to get the outcomes we expected, because there just seems to be so many people who are offering. How do you pick the good one? Well, I, I, I mean, well, there, there are different ways to do it. I mean, if you go onto the Choice website, they will give you 
a whole lot of reports uh, that they have done in terms of recommendations of who are more reliable than others. And I agree with you. I mean, one of the big issues is that what we're talking about here is we're talking about change in our society that maybe you can compare with what happened with the Industrial Revolution in Europe. That's what we're looking at. We're not looking at something that's small or tiny. We're looking at absolutely massive change. And what that means is absolutely massive change in rules and regulations that govern every single part of our life. And they're not going to happen quickly. For example, if we took up the idea that maybe instead of electric cars, we think about electric buggies and electric scooters, straight away, you've got a, a whole raft of legal regulations and changes that need to be completely remodeled. As far as solar panels go, in a minute, I'm going to turn to the conference that Janine and I and Peggy and John Robins went to called Energy Next. And one of the key issues that came out of that conference in every single presenter was the number of changes that need to be made. And talking, Bill, about solar panels, for example, one of the people who spoke about that was saying one of the biggest issues we've got is that regulations are literally changing from day to day regarding the installation of solar panels. And of course, the other thing about it I'm gonna to come to in a minute is the rate at which technology is changing. I mean, the, the things that we saw and heard about, which I'm gonna to go to in a minute at Energy Next was just absolutely mind blowing and way beyond what most people have got any sort of understanding of. So, yep, I agree with you. Um, and, you know, it's, it's something that is not going to happen easily or simply, um, as I want to come to uh, towards the end of what I want to say. But I understand where you're coming from. Stuart, if you're still there, you. wherever you are, yes. can you no. Was it Stuart who was talking about the uh, electric vehicle? Yeah, the plateau, the plateau group, this is about yeah. 10 years ago, yeah. put, up, put up a proposal for the manufacture of small electric cars based yeah. on the golf car type yeah. size, yeah. which we thought was, could be made very, very cheaply because you, if you limit them to a speed of say 60K yeah. and limit them to a range basically within your postcode area, but a bit outside yeah. and, and not allow them on freeways and things like that, you've got a very large niche market there of about That's a million right. households who need a second car of that kind and an aged person's vehicle. Yep. or being able to remain independent in the home. Yep. So that's, if someone yep. wants me to send the proposal along, Janine can certainly give you my uh, email address and I'll send you, you know, a copy of the whole proposal. That would be wonderful. Thank you for that. That's what I wanted to ask you. Could you do that, please? Okay, can we move on to the next slide, please, Wayne? Okay, this is, these are just a couple of things that I haven't got time to go into in great detail. If you're interested in any of this, you can go on to the website of Energy Next and you'll find that you'll be able to access any of the presentations that were part of that particular conference. But all I can tell you is that for all of us who went, it blew our minds about what we were hearing about. So the first thing is the industrial heat pumps that are being developed, not just for home, but for um, industrial level. And we're talking particularly about those that might replace um, the current power uh, sources for the production of steel and aluminium in Australia, which take enormous amounts of fossil fuel energy. We heard about 
In Newcastle University, for example, batteries that are already been developed from emulsified water. And that emulsified water um, provides the basis for the development of supercapacitors and redox flow batteries. Now, I don't understand all of that. All I can tell you is that they are about being able to regenerate and store energy in ways that we haven't got at the moment to be able to produce batteries that will be much cheaper, much more reliable, much more efficient than what we've got at the present time. And they're already being used in the Newcastle light rail system where you have two banks of supercapacitors. One bank is already charged. And so it takes you from point one to point two. While that's happening, the battery of your supercapacitors on the other side are being recharged. They will take you from point two to point three, where the other capacitors now will be recharged so they can take you from point four three to point four or point four to point five. A little bit like the regenerating braking that goes on in my electric MG. Um, we've got solar panels already developed in windows, which will be able to both heat the house and also keep it cool. Um, and as, uh, as well as that, we saw solar panels that basically were in rolls of plastic. If any of you watched Q&A a couple of weeks ago, you would have seen the guy from University of uh, New South Wales actually roll it out across the panel. And, and when we start thinking about PV panels that are actually encased in something like that, the potential of what that can be used for is just absolutely enormous. And that's the sort of um, way in which the cars that are competing um, in events to drive electric cars around Australia are actually generating their, their, um, their electricity. And already we've got cars that are being produced that have solar panels built into the roof that allow you to charge your car during the daytime and then will charge up the battery that you will then be able to plug into your home system when you come home at night time. So as Saul Griffith says, you're not only buying an electric car for your money, you're also buying a home battery as well. And although that is in its early stages, um, it certainly, certainly is going to become more and more possible. And the other thing that's really important is about the development of smart meters so that we're going to be able to track what our energy sources are. So, for example, if you take your electric car up to Coles, um, as I do at St Ives, and you plug it into the fast charger up there, then your energy source is actually whoever it is that's Coles is getting its electric energy from. When I come home and plug it into my own home system, then my energy provider is in fact my particular provider of electric energy. If I drive it to Orange, as I've done many times, then in fact, it is the household as my friends in Orange and their electric energy company that's actually providing my electricity. So we're gonna be increasingly wanting to be able to track where our sources of energy are coming from. And we're now developing meters that allow us to be able to track where our energy is coming from every five minutes, 24 seven um, through, the, through the year. Now that's just, they're just very briefly, some of the things that we heard about, which actually starts to get you thinking completely differently to the way that we thought in the past about what might be possible. Thank you, Wayne. Does anybody want to ask quickly any questions about that? Because we need to work through this next one fairly quickly. Just really quickly, if I may, on smart meters. Um, yep. Sorry, we can't get a smart meter at our address because there's no, um, is inadequate radio coverage from the um, Aus, Ausgrids scheme, uh, sorry, uh, network, radio network. Okay. Um, I've, I've asked them several times to, you know, when that's going to happen and nobody can tell me. So All right, well, I can give you a site for that if you want to, if you're interested in me sending you 
a site that you can do that. There's a company that actually is engaged in all that at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, if we can move very quickly um, to the next slide, because last time we did this, someone said to me, how much is it going to cost? So what I did was went away and did very quickly um, a calculation of this. It's going to depend on how many renewable structures are already installed. It's going to depend also um, on the current costs that it will reduce very quickly. So if you look at um, the possibility of what we're talking about, it's going to cost about $5,000 for a 6.5 kilowatt system we were talking about before. An induction plate will cost you about $2,000. An electric vehicle, um, for, for about around $40,000. Although at the moment, if you go to the good car company, then in fact, you can buy a secondhand Nissan Leaf for about 20 to 25 grand. Um, they're, in, they, they're imported by a good car company who are important currently about two to 3,000 a year. There's a four month wait on them. Uh, <coughs> next year, they'll be importing something between 20 and 30,000 of these vehicles. They also are able to import uh, Hyundai and the new Polestar, which is about to revolutionize the electric car industry because it's the first car that's actually capable of being able to tow um, a small caravan um, or a trailer. Split, split system heat pump will cost you somewhere between four and seven grand. And the total cost for all of that is about $54,000. If you look at um, the, uh, if you look at the subsidies that are gradually coming on board. So for example, um, there's 3,700 subsidy being offered at the moment through New South Wales government. And there's also subsidies going to happen through the national government. Um, and if you think about a secondhand um, electric vehicle or a bike or a scooter, then you're looking at probably something like $34,000. Um, and if you want to think about the whole of Bradfield, then we're looking at something like $3.2 billion. But in what we've got to think about in terms of that is that by 2030, if we were able to do that, every household would be saving four and a half thousand um, every year. And the savings by community of Bradfield by 2030 would be $266 million. And if you think about what $266 million could do for the communities in Bradfield and what sort of infrastructure we might be able to build and develop with that, then in fact, um, a lot of the savings are offset, I think. So, um, I think we need to go probably to the last slide, please, Wayne, because we need to finish fairly quickly. What have we done so far? Okay, we've got the website, which I urge you to go on to and register if you're interested. We have formed our initial planning group. We've had our first meeting and we've now got our second meeting next week. We've got the development of a strategic plan for 2022 which is really about community education, community development, going to lots of organisations, making lots of connections and talking with lots of people, doing the research that we need to do, and then planning particularly for 2023, but then on the basis of that um, for the next 10 years. So if we look at going forward and making it happen, what are the challenges? Well, one of the big challenges is connecting with Bradfield communities. In other words, we've got to turn our vision into some sort of mission that people are going to be able to work with um, us on. We've got to connect with other like organisations and groups. And I said, there's, there's a great number of other groups that we've already made contact with. We're going to continue that in our next meeting with Sarah and the group from... Um, Bradfield uh, um, reduce emissions. Um, the economy is an incredibly challenging time at which to try and ask residents to spend money. There's no doubt about that. Um, but remember that Bradfield is one of the wealthiest um, electorates in Australia, and that maybe offsets it a little bit. Probably the most important issue we've got is how to raise capital and what's the best way to be able to do that. And that's going to occupy quite a lot of our next meeting. Um, <clears throat> retrofitting, how do we go about retrofitting 
the, the sort of infrastructure we've already got? How do we convince the deniers and the skeptics? And that's part of the social research. And a couple of us have been doing social research for a long, long time as our academic career. Um, dealing with the self-interests of those individuals and companies engaged in fossil fuels. How do we deal with Woodside, for example, that got $118 billion from the Morrison government to be able to develop the plant out Carasa, where I've actually stood and seen petroglyphs that are 150,000 years old, the oldest in the world, being destroyed every day by the emissions from that gas plant. How are we gonna deal with the Scarborough gas plant by Woodside that puts every year the equivalent of 15 fossil fuel power stations back into the atmosphere? Um, and when the CEO was sort of uh, um, asked the question by Sarah Ferguson the other night, she just brushed it off and said, well, we're going to be able to control the emissions. Well, we know that that's absolute rubbish. Um, changing laws, regulations and brown tape, which we've already talked about. Creating the subsidies to reduce the costs and encourage adoption. And also about informing and continuing to educate ourselves. So could we have the last slide, please, Wayne? And what are the positive factors, though? Let's finish on a positive speed. note. Well, get, go, go to settings. Sorry? The positive changes in attitudes that we've already talked about is everywhere. I mean, the whole zeitgeist of Australia has changed in terms of looking at what we need to do about trying to confront climate change. There have been positive changes towards action on climate by every one of the governments. There's attitudes towards action on climate change in the Bradfield electorate. The number of groups in Bradfield and adjacent suburbs and across New South Wales, I had a whole lot that I was gonna tell you about, which I haven't got time, but there are, there are massive numbers. I'm getting 10 and 12 emails a week from groups all over Australia that are involved in the same thing we are. There's a history of concern with environment and heritage in Bradfield. We're a relatively wealthy and highly educated population. There are rapid changes in technology that are going to reduce the costs of renewable energy infrastructure. And, and we're building that energy of concern about climate change and its impacts and the determination to act absolutely right now. And all I can tell you is that anybody who can afford to and is not driving an electric vehicle is crazy because there's no road noise. There's absolutely so few working parts in the, in the, in the engine that the number of services you need are far less than what you need with a petrol combustion engine. It's much cheaper. My MG service charges are half of what any petrol combustion engine is. Um, and as well as that, you have a big plug smile on your dial every time you drive past a service station. So people, <laughs> let's get with it and let's get electrified. <laughs> and so Wayne, can we finish with a little song that I happen to be a bit of a song, singer songwriter as well. And so I've written a little song that tries to summarize everything I've been saying that might be a theme song for rewiring Bradfield. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the song. It's the words that are most important. And lovely Wayne has actually put the words on the screen for you to follow. Not my voice, just watch the words. <laughs> For millions of years, a fossil sun. fuel stayed yeah. in our earth. Australia had loads of them, but no one gave them birth. First Nations people warmed on highways and wood. But an older country they knew and understood. 220 years since Europeans came Mining fossil fuels 
has been a rich man's corporate game. The world's populations needed energy for all. But Australia just kept digging for itself and those offshore. Palmer, Reinhardt, Adani are making millions from us rape. Fossil fuel lobbyist to Canberra Rock made Sanders. great haste. Scientists gave warning, Earth's ocean sky is too warm. Tensions, dangerous levels, now we have to heed their call. Electrify, electrify, we all must electrify him. Renewably we electrify them, or we can save the world. Australia has much sun and wind, don't need no gas, coal or oil. Fossil energy's what we don't need, just dirty, dangerous and old. Renewable is the way to go, clean, cheap and reliable too. Uh, rid ourselves of mining barons, let's get battery wise, will you? Once we really needed them, before we understood the damage uh, we were doing uh, to ourselves, our earth, our food. But now that we know better, we don't have no excuse. To leave those fossil fuels behind, they are no further use. And electrify, electrify, we all must electrify. We renewably electrify, then we can save the world. Let's all work together, we can do this if we try. Forget our politicians, let's heal Othan's earth and sky. The arguments to do it, they're sound, they're right, they're good. Leave gas, coal, oil in the ground, deep, deep underground. Electrify, electrify, we all need to electrify. If we electrify, we can save the world. Electrify, electrify, we all need to electrify. If we do not electrify, then we'll destroy our world. Electrify, electrify, we all need to electrify. And if you don't electrify, you'll help to destroy our world. <laughs> Terrific. Great. Thank you. Very inspiring. <laughs> thank you, David. That was really wonderful. And thank you for sharing your really creative electric energy which is really what the whole point of this webinar is Thank you. normally we finish with a song and we and that's it <laughs> i did have a few more slides but don't worry about those slides because i'm going to send them to you because you're all registered to come so we'll finish tonight because it's up to seven o'clock but we will be planning another webinar in a month the um the, the tuesday that we're on uh, tonight, the uh, first, this is the second Tuesday of the month. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, the first, we're going to be meeting Tuesday. again. Yes. And also, if you could just pencil in the 14th of October, that's a Saturday night, Saturday the 14th of October. Friday. 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 Yeah, Friday the Friday. 14th of October. Oops. I'll say that again. Friday the 14th of <laughs> October. Because we're going to have a concert down at South. Taramara with Wayne loosely woven um, band and we are going to have a fundraising to electrify Bradfield. So you'll get more you details. And again, the device audio. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, <laughs> here's our slide here. Yeah, Friday the 14th of October, 7 o'clock. So we'll be having more news about that coming oh, up. Yes, yeah. So thank you I again, David, and for that really informative and yeah. energizing thing. Peggy, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we might save that one for the next one, okay? He knows I'm there, but can't see me, but I don't know. Hi, hi. Um, yeah. If, um, you please please be quiet if you're not oh, going to oh, mute. Yeah. <laughs> um, Janine, can we? Um, can, can you send us all a copy of David's um, slide? Yes. Yeah, we'll we'll do that. Yes. Thank yes. you. Hmm. Um, sorry. Okay. So everyone, right? We'll say good night. Yep. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Okay. Anybody yeah. want to Thank say everyone? Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Thanks, everyone.